sure a couple extras will trickle, but uh, thank you everybody for joining us um, today. Uh, Dr. Torco um, is going to present on a two by two table um, using categorical data um, using GRAPAD PRISM. And uh, Dr. Torco works for us at the Biostatistics and Bioinformatics Shared Resource. She's located in the um, Department of Pathology, though she does a lot of work uh, with biorepository specimens. And uh, yeah, she's a really great instructor. So looking forward to her presentation. Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining today. I'm sure this is hardly an exciting title, but um, I often call this the fabulous two by two table because you can boil a lot of analyses down and it's a very versatile tool. And so today what I'm planning on doing is giving you, um, we're only gonna look at a subset of analyses you can actually do with the two by two contingency table. Um, we're gonna ask a question, is that how are, is there a difference in proportions between two independent groups of categorical data? So what we'll do is we'll use a chi-square or a Fisher's exact test to test the difference there. And I'll tell you when to use uh, either of those and how to do them in PRISM. And how do you do measurements on paired categorical data? How do they agree? How do, well do the measurements agree? And for this, we'll use the McNamara's test. Do two reviewers agree? I'm gonna show examples of two pathologists who read the same specimen, and you want to determine if um, they actually are reading or di uh, diagnosing disease in the same, to the same degree, and we'll use a Kappa statistic for that. And if we have time again, uh, I don't know how it will go. If, if you have questions, this is one thing, please break it. I don't see the chat. So um, either the Andrews could tell me if there's a question or if you just wanna turn your speaker on and ask a question, I don't mind being interrupted at any time. And if you have a chance, we'll get through to the characteristics of a diagnostic test and specifically sensitivity, specificity, and the predictive values. And I am not covering a lot of things you can do like an ROC analysis, um, some binomial tests and such, but maybe in a future presentation, we can go on and discuss that. So there are two basic types of categorical data nominal where you just have given it a name as like male, female, disease, yes, no, whether you test positive. Um, and then you have a rank and order where you can have ordinal. It's not as important with a two by two table, but here I, I show a three by three table where you categorize people into different increasing categories of increasing body mass index or glucose, um, serum glucose levels. And you can categorize um, continuous data as a categorical variable. It's often done with the body mass index. And it makes it a little bit, I think, more intuitive to understand. But it is a little bit uh, controversial. You know, some statisticians will say you really shouldn't categorize um, data that is continuous. Because what if there's a difference between people, say they're in the low normal range of weight, and those who are in the high level, maybe they have different risk profiles, and they're just all lumped into one category as normal. So, so for some analyses, you won't want to categorize, but I think it can also help you understand your data um, and maybe give you some indications. And people will often use um, like median, if they're not sure where a cutoff would be, say to mark a, if a test is positive or not, or you can look at quartiles, or you might have a biologically or clinically relevant cutoff point as is in this extreme example here, because you're rarely gonna see data like this, where you have test values and all the test values that lie below this cutoff all have, don't have cancer. And all the values above here do have cancer. And that way it's very simple. You say, if your value is on this part of the scale, well, you're going to have cancer or you do have cancer. And if it's down here, you don't. Usually you have the distribution of test scores are intermingled as we'll see. So the contingency table um, is call, called by R by C. So it's rows by column. And here we have a three by three. And this will be the last time I'll mention a more than two by two, but I wanted to just use this as an example that what you put in the data table are counts. You don't put medians, you don't put uh, uh, P values or anything like that. You want counts. So in your study that you did, you observed that 47 people had normal body mass index and 
normal serum glucose levels. 25 people, for example, were obese and had diabetic levels. And if you sum up all the numbers, that's going to be your sample size for your study. In the two by two table, of course, you just have two rows and two columns. And um, you have here, you're putting your observed values into the table. So you've counted up your sample size of 838 and you've put 38 did progress and 38 took drug X. Your question here, you said, I wonder in people who progressed in their disease and didn't, is there a difference in the proportion of those who took the drug X? And I have here the percentage. This is the column percentage of people who progressed and took drug X. It's 39.2 and 36.2 for people who did not progress. Now, that may not be a big difference. I don't know if that's a clinically relevant difference, but you can uh, run a test on this and determine a p-value that might help you decide if it is or not. It won't tell you if it's less than 0.05 that it is important. That's up to you to decide. You're the one that wants to make sure whether this is an important difference or not. And by convention, um, these different cells in the table have labels. This is cell A, B, C, and D. And you need to know that if you're going to calculate when you look at the formulas that are used to calculate some of the test statistics, um, each of these have to have a name with that. So in order to determine if there's a difference in proportions, if people take drug X between those who progress and those who didn't, you can run either a chi-square test of independence or a Fisher's exact test. Now, a little stats necessities here. You can't give a stats talk without having a little bit of information about uh, the, uh, how you calculate the test statistic. So a chi-square here is calculated by the sum of these values that you calculate for each cell in your table. So the observed, this is for observed value, is what you actually observed from your data. So O here for um, cell A would be 38. The expected value is calculated by multiplying the row total and the column total, dividing by the grand total or your total sample size for each of the four cells in your, your two by two table. So for cell A, you would multiply 306 times 97 and divide by 838. And you come up with a value of 35.4. And you would do this for each cell in your table. Then you would plug those in, the values, the observed 38 minus 35.4, and you'd square it because if your observed value is larger or, or smaller than you're expected, you don't want to have a negative number when you're summing. So you square it so you only end up with positive numbers. And then you divide it for each cell by the um, expected number for that cell. You sum them up, and that is your chi-square statistic. And for a one degree of freedom table, which the two by two table is, uh, you have different distributions of the chi-square dependent on what the number of cells you have in your contingency table. For the two by two table, it, the degrees of freedom is calculated by the number of rows minus one. So I have two rows minus one, that's one. Number of columns minus one, which is two columns minus one is one and one times one is one. So it's very simple. And this here then represents the line of the distribution of the chi-square statistics for a table with one degree of freedom. Now the critical value that determines if you have a P less than or equal to 0.05, and I'm, by convention, um, you can set your P value, which you like, like it to be. You may want to set it at 0.01, for example, or, um, but the convention is, we'll, for this talk, we'll just assume that we're talking about an alpha of 0.05, or then we have a P of 0.05. So the critical value with your one degree of freedom table is at 3.84. And that means the distribution of this test statistic, 5% of the values are over this. So if you have a test a chi-square statistic that is greater than 3.84, you know you're going to have a p-value that will be less than 0.05. The assumptions for using this test is that the observations or the counts in each cell are independent. So you can't simultaneously be progress and take the drug and also not progress and take the drug. Each of these would represent an individual person or individual mouse um, that are independent of each other. And you must have sufficient numbers in each cell for the chi-square. 
there used to be something that was called the Cochrane's rule that you'd follow about less than 5% of the cells having values less than five. And certainly you can't have a cell where there are no expected values that you calculate are equal to zero. But um, I, as I'm gonna actually foreshadow, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna tell you that you should be using the Fisher's exact test and not worry so much about some of the criteria and using the chi-square. For most values, these days we'll be using the Fisher exact test. So as my example for calculating a chi-square and Fisher's exact, I'm going way back into history, looking at a seminal paper published in 1950 that linked smoking to lung cancer. This was published um, by two statisticians, Dahl and Hill. And what they did at the time, they weren't sure what was causing the increase in lung cancer cases that they'd been observing. And they thought one uh, was that air pollution was increasing, um, but other people thought that the increase in cigarette smoking in particular was uh, contributing to this rise in lung cancer cases. And uh, at the time, smoking was extremely popular. Um, I think most of us will see in this table that most people smoked. And it was also touted as being very healthy for people because it calmed. And um, I know my dad was an ex-smoker who had to quit um, because he developed lung issues. And he said he missed smoking every single day of his life after that. So it does have some, some kind of benefit, but as we'll see it also, as we all know well, that it has a very detrimental effect, which is the lung cancer. So what Dahl and Hill did is they found hospitals in London they were reported when lung cancer cases came in, they would send out a team that would go assess and make sure that it was actually a lung cancer diagnosis. And then they would interview the patient or his or her family and ask certain issues, uh, specifically about smoking. What did they smoke? Um, how much did they smoke? You know, did they smoke cigars or cigarettes and such? And they put together a two by two table. This is stratified by gender. I think they did it largely because you can see at the time, 2% of the men were non-smokers in this table. There are only two in the lung cancer group and 27 in the control group out of 649 patients in each. So what they did was when the hospitals where they had the lung cancer, they found a patient from the same hospital, maybe the same clinic who didn't have lung cancer and that was their control group. So the only 2% of the men were non-smokers, but their definition of non-smoking included people who smoked Say you had six cigarettes in a week, you smoked one a day, except maybe you took it off on Sunday, didn't have one because you didn't want to bother your mom at uh, Sunday dinner. Um, you were considered a non-smoker. Smoking was so prevalent. And it was a lot lower in women and largely, largely because there were social taboos at the time. And actually at one point when uh, cigarettes started becoming popular, women were jailed if they were found smoking in public. So we see here, we have two two by two tables we have the number of smokers. So two people were non-smokers in the lung cancer group with 647 smokers, 27 non-smokers in the control non-lung cancer group and 622 smokers. They calculated an exact p-value here, which they would have used the Fisher's method. And you can see they reported a lot of numbers of zeros here. Uh, convention now is we don't go to that level of detail. Uh, usually you're going to see, as, as PRISM does report, that you're going to have a P here less than 0. 0.0001. They also then, for the females, they actually did a chi-square statistic here. And here is the test statistic they calculated. And you know that this is greater than 3.84, that we're going to have a P less than 0.05. And here, and here is the one degree of freedom. And they used to, you'd look these values up, the chi-square values according to degree of freedom into a, a book. And sometimes they would just report the range. They say, well, your p-value given these parameters is going to fall somewhere between 0.01 and 0.02 with the conclusion that it is below 0.05. Excuse me. <clears throat> so to do a chi-square Fisher's exact test in PRISM, what you do is you open it up and you go to the contingency table and what's very nice is if you're not sure how to put the data in or you want a little bit of help in doing it and interpreting it, you can always use a sample data and they go through a very nice tutorial that you can follow there. But we know how to do it. And we're, so we're just going to enter data into the table. You press create and then you get this uh, window will come up for the contingency table format. 
And what you're going to do, I rearranged slightly the uh, data from that two by two table for smoking in males. Because I like to have, if I'm concerned with smoking in lung cancer, I like to have my A cell represent what risks I'm really interested in. And so we have the smoke yes here and can lung cancer yes here. So you would fill in the squares here with the counts, with the numbers. And I would always recommend that you put a title in for both the rows and columns. And also you rename your table. You might say Dolan Hill 1950 smoking males. And that way, because if you can have, if you do a number of different analyses on the data, you can keep track of it and it makes it easier to follow. So here I've entered the data into the table. And what you do is click analyze. This window pops up and it automatically highlights that you're going to do a chi-square or Fisher's exact test because that seems to be the format and PRISM starts to assume that what you want to do. And it also collects both, both columns uh, that you want to compare. So you hit OK. And this window pops up and it's going to give you some options about it. Um, later on, if we have time, we're going to go and we'll check for sensitivity specificity. And if I do a future lecture, you might go into some univariate relative risk and odds ratios. But PRISM will almost always automatically insert the, uh, assume you're going to do a Fisher's exact test. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit later, but um, let's look first at the options here tab. So you click to the options here. And I would leave the default because it, the default is a two-sided test with 95% confidence intervals. And you can format if you want a fewer decimal places on your p-values, you can um, do that as well. But I would leave it at two-sided and don't go to one-sided. It is more statistically honest to do a two-sided test. And that's an, uh, actually a topic for another lecture. Um, but so I would just leave the defaults as they are. And I'm actually now going to um, click on the chi-square because we'll do the Fisher's exact nest, but we'll start with the chi-square test and here are the results that you get. It will repeat the table here that you know that you put it in properly. Um, we'll give you what the row totals are. So these are the number of people who have lung cancer who smoke and the percentage of people who have lung cancer but don't smoke. But we're interested actually in this one, we wanted to know of the people of lung cancer, how many smoke. You see it's a big, it's up almost 100% here. And this is 90, 96%, so a lot of people are smoking. But the results are here, it gives you your chi-square test statistic, which is 22.04. And the astute observers here will say, oh, that's greater than 3.84. So therefore, we know that we're going to have a p-value of less than 0.05. And then it's one degree of freedom. That's all correct. We would expect that from a two-by-two two table. And here's our p-value of less than 0.001. Now, or 0001, okay? Now it did have a little warning thing that appeared at the bottom. It says, consider using Fisher's test instead of chi-square. Fisher's test calculates an exact p-value, while chi-square chi -square only calculates an approximation. With large sample sizes, the difference is trivial. With small sample sizes, the difference can be important. And I have a slide that shows you how important that is. So let's do the Fisher's exact test. I'll go back and ask it to run here. Um, it didn't do a test statistic. It just gave me the p-value because it gives you the exact p-value. It does this by calculating all the, um, based on what you have in your table, it calculates all the permutations of how the data would go in and then calculate what yours is. So if you have 100 permutations, <coughs> sorry, based on your sample size, you have one out of 100. If you have 1,000 samples, then you're going to have one out of a thousand. So you can see with a larger sample size, your p-value is going to be smaller. And that's kind of thing to keep in mind whenever you run statistical tests and how that sample size can influence uh, how small or large your p-value is. <coughs> Sorry, let me, let me take a little sip of... Okay, Fisher's exact test is rather computationally heavy. And in fact, I worked with a woman who learned to do statistics about 40 years ago. And she used, learned on a program <clears throat> that is no longer available and didn't work on any modern machine. She had a laptop that was almost 40 years old that she ran the program on. And she asked me to check over some stats she ran. 
and asked her, why did you do a chi-square? You should have done a Fisher's exact. And she said, well, my computer won't do it. It's just too difficult for the computer. And yes, the processing speed of that old computer probably couldn't handle this because the way you calculate the Fisher's exact test is you have a lot of factorials. You take the counts from L uh, cells A and B and add that up and do factorial. And as a reminder to you, if like a factorial, 100 factorial is you take 100, you multiply 99 times 98 times 97 times 95 and so on until you get to one. And as you can appreciate, that's going to be a very large number and rather computationally you know, time consuming to do that. But you're gonna do it nine times based on the different combination of counts and then your total N, then the total number A and so on. So, um, but with our computers today, it's really not much of an issue. So you shouldn't really be using the Fisher's exact test based on uh, sample size. Although I, I did reach a limit once when I put a chi-square or put in values into PRISM, and it was a pretty large number, and it automatically defaulted to the chi-square. Also, they will not do the Fisher's exact if you have any more than a two by two table. And the assumptions of the Fisher's exact test is that your counts are independent, just like it is for the chi-square. Now, what happens if you have a value of zero? Say that you have a zero cell here, and you can appreciate the factorial of zero is zero, and you're going to have then a zero in your denominator, which as we know is kind of a nonsense value. Uh, you're going to get an error and then having a zero. But what programs do, and, and I'm not sure what PRISM does with this, but what you can do, if you do the same mathematical adjustment to all the values, like adding 0.5 to all cells or one or some value that then we won't have the zero cell, and then you can then calculate uh, your value. It might be inflated slightly in sample size, but probably not enough to make a big difference in your results. So here's an example about how smaller sample sizes, and I'm talking probably about less than 100 here. And what I did is I set up a table where I had a 20% proportion in this group and a 50%. So I wanted to look if there was a difference between this and going by sample size. So all I did was I set this up and I just kept the same proportions, but doubled each time and going down to 100. So what I have here is you see if, if I run the chi-square test and the Fisher's exact test on these, they're very similar. And I just did the ratio to show the Fisher's to the chi-square P that as you see, as the sample size gets smaller, the ratio is getting larger in that the chi-square is always an underestimate of the p-value compared to the Fisher's exact test. So if you have a large sample size, uh, you could run either chi-square or Fisher's, but certainly if you have a smaller sample size, you can see here how you, you get to the same conclusion that the values were less than 0.05, so you declare that they were statistically significant, and the same thing here. But here we have a conundrum. We have, with 40 sample size, we have a P of 0 0.047 for chi-square, but a point, you know, point 0.1 for Fisher's exact. Now, you may go, oh my God, I'm going to do a chi-square here because I then can declare that this is statistically significant. No, what you need to do is don't p-hack. You decide you're going to do a Fisher's exact where possible and accept that as the true, because this is a biased estimate of the actual truth. So do the Fisher's exact when you can. And also it's up to you. I mean, I'm telling you like what the p-values are. You really want to look at the differences again. Do you believe that 20% and 50% are clinically or biologically significant? And it's, you know, the p-value may vary depending on your sample size, but it really is for you to say, okay, maybe we didn't reach statistical significance, but we do believe that this would be a, this is a clinically significant difference. And probably what you would have done prior to running your experiments, you would have done a power and sample size calculation saying, we think this is the difference and we want to have a power a level and number in our um, study group that we can say that we will reach a p-value of less than 0.5 if it exists, okay? Now I just did the females quickly, uh, the lung cancer here, the same, the numbers were smaller, but there was a bigger difference in, it was only like three percentage points difference between males. Here we have a bigger difference with the females. <clears throat> and when I run the, I, I did both the chi-square here and the Fisher's exact. And as far as the p-value, you can see the Fisher's exact is uh, 0 0.03. And this is 0 0.02. So again, this is a biased result given that we have a, a smaller sample size. It's less than a, 
Um, this is what's 120. So even with the, it's over 100, you really do be, need to be careful that you could have a biased result from the chi square. But also, I, I, some people I know might say that, well, look at this. Um, we have a smaller p value than we have in men. So that must mean that the, the effect of smoking is stronger in men compared to women. Please don't say that. You know, it really, the p value is really so dependent on sample size that you really can't use that to ascertain what the real effect is. You have to look at what the differences in percentages are, not what the p value is telling you. Um, and also with the uh, two by two table for chi square um, or the Fisher's exact, you can put the data in any way you want. Here I have lung cancer, yes, no, here. But here I have lung cancer, no, yes. And smoking, no, yes. You know, as long as the values are in the same category. So here's the 41, yes, yes. And here's 41, yes, yes. As that, that you'll get the same results with the Fisher's exact or the chi square. It's, that's going to be the same no matter how you look at the data or how you, you would enter it. You just have to be careful how you that would interpret and how you would calculate your percentages of the differences. But also um, we'd be aware though, if you, you can't do the same thing when you're looking at sensitivity specificity or you wanna calculate a relative risk or odds ratio, it's how you put the data in as it's related to your research question. So in this case, we wanna know lung cancer is the outcome that we want to study Smoking is the exposure. This is kind of epidemiologist speak I'm using here. But have your outcome in the columns and your exposure or your test positive that you are negative here. And your in the A value have the one that you really is your hypothesis. We're asking is smoking related to lung cancer. And so have your yes, yes in the A column and have the others fill in appropriately. And if you just keep doing it that way, I think then when you do other analyses with the table, you'll be able to keep it straight. So now we'll go on to the paired data with the McNamara's test. And it was developed in, or published in 1947 by Quinn McNamara, who was a professor of psychology and statistics at, at Stanford. I guess the crazy statistician here. But what he did was he developed this test that used when you want to compare with paired data is, are you finding the same thing like between two tests? Are the two tests finding the same values on this using the same material that you're testing on? So here's an example of where you have a, a test where you've done on the same sample, you've done a test one and then a different test. And you then categorize where in this cell, they both agree the results are both positive here. Test two said it was positive and test one said it was negative and test one positive, test two negative. And here they agree. McNamara doesn't care. The test doesn't care what you say. If you agree, that's good. You agree. What the test looks at is where the discrepancy is. And that's in these marginal cells, B and C. And it only uses the values in the discrepant cells to cal calculate the chi-square statistic. So you look at the number in cell B minus the number in cell C, which you again square just in case it's a negative value. And you divide that by the total of the two cells. Now the assumption is it's paired data. You're, these are results being done on the same sample or the same person or the same mouse. And that the mice or the people are independent, but other that you're uh, who provided the samples. And the McNamara's test is actually testing if there's consistency between these marginal cells. So in a perfect test, these would be zero and the tests would agree perfectly in uh, categorizing positive and negative results. But what it looks at, they think if these cells are about the same, say you have five in this and five or six in this one, they're making about the same error rate in their diagnosis. But if this is two and this is 20, then you're going to see some discrepancies and you'll probably then get a P less than 0.05 leading to a conclusion that the tests are performing differently. For this example, I'm going to, just checking the time here. Um, I'm using a paper published this year, looking at improving mammography, the contrast enhanced mammography, in order to try to ascertain if you can determine people who have women who have suspicious findings, well, actually men get breast cancer too. So people who have uh, suspicious findings might usually go on and just and have a biopsy, but they thought there might be a way if you were to enhance the imaging that you would be able to better 
determine those who have suspicious findings or if they would need to go on to biopsy. And they had here the histopathology, which is they had a, a tissue specimen, either biopsy or maybe a lumpectomy, were they able to define if it was actual cancer or if it was benign tissue? And so what they did is they collected, um, it was in women only, suspicious findings, and they enrolled them in the study. And they did both the RCEM, the enhanced uh, imaging, and also the histopathology on that. And what they concluded from, I'll give you the conclusion of their study, because they actually did a more complex analysis than I'm presenting here, excuse me, that they would have avoided about 16.4% of the women who would have normally gone on to biopsy wouldn't, didn't have to based on that. So here we have the histology said cancer, and this was like positive for, I say, potential cancer here. And here they say it's both negative. And here's the discrepancy where they disagree, where RCM says that these were positive, but his, histopathology said it was benign. So to do a... Um, uh, McNamara's test, what you need to do is go to, you leave the program prism and you go to GraphPad's Quick Calcs, Quick Calcs website at this address. And here will come up a number of things that you can test. Um, and we're interested in categorical data. Uh, I find this random number generator kind of useful um, for like small things when people ask me to randomize animal studies. But here we have categorical data and here, oh, Fishers, Chi-Score, oh, McNamara's. Okay, that's what we want. So you click on that. And then you get another choice. We want, actually, let's go down. Oh, here's our McNamara's test. Okay. Now I'm going to warn you, they did it in the, uh, as the example, in a matched case control study where they did a study where the cases and controls were matched. Maybe they were siblings, maybe they were twins, or maybe they were matched by age, race, gender, ethnicity, and other things. So they're not exactly independent. They do have some correlation on some important uh, factors. So they would be considered matched that. So the, the way that uh, PRISM then presents the results of this, it's a little bit not quite exactly what we're doing when we're comparing two tests. But, um, what you do here, you, you come up with this um, table that you fill in. Here are the two rows that have the discordant pairs. Here we have the benign and then the RCM positive and histopathology benign. And you put the five here. Now they call them cases and controls. And in their table, the controls are here and the cases are here. Now you could put it in either way, you're gonna get the same results, but the percentages might be a little off. You have to make sure how you interpret it. Um, and then you have the, er, the ones that agree, the 75 and the 29 here. So you calculate then. And I've put in red here, uh, more relating to comparing two tests rather than the cases and controls. And what we're saying is that we're going to test that our example, the two tests produce the same results. The proportions of the discordant pairs are the same. So that's our null hypothesis. That's the thing we're, we're trying to, the straw dog, we're trying to knock down with our test. And what you find here, so they, they go through and they explain, they said that there was a 15, that 75%, and they reproduce the table here. So of the discordant pairs, 75% were in the RCM positive and the histopathology negative category. And so you calculate the percentage and the differences between the discordant. And here is our two-tailed p-value of 0.044, or 0 0.04 is good enough. So what we would say that our two tests have different performances. We don't ex we, uh, reject the null hypothesis and say that actually the two tests are slightly different from each other. And um, so in our example, the 75% of the discordant pairs were the positive RCM and the negative pathology. So, and they give you the test statistic and the degrees of freedom, which you would expect. And it's the same thing with the 3.84 uh, critical value for this test. Okay, why is it not going down? Oh, there it is. So interpreting, just to, just to reiterate it, because I, I sometimes have a hard time when I'm trying to think, okay, how exactly do I interpret this McNamara's test? Here is the p-value that uh, calculated with a chi-square, the test statistic of 4.05, one degree of freedom. Um, and so we say, well, there is a discordant, uh, discordance that actually the RCM is detecting more positives. In fact, the positive rate here is 72.6. Uh, That's 90 over the total sample size. 
whereas histology has a lower positivity rate. So the RCEM is erring on the side of picking up more cases, um, which actually may not be bad to think, well, if you, the test says these, that these people are potentially have cancer and they would then go on to have biopsy, that's erring on the side of you know, trying to make sure that they don't have cancer. What is more worrisome perhaps is that where the RCEM says that it is negative, where we know from histopathology that they have cancer. So these are the kinds of things when you, you get the results, you say, okay, they're not saying doing the same thing. And of course, histopathology is like the gold standard when you get actual tissue and determine but, uh, that you have cancer or not. But it's not a pleasant procedure to go through, and I can attest to that. So. I uh, think it's admirable that they're, they're trying to limit where you have a suspicious finding that you limit those who go on to biopsy. Now, this is the uh, diabetes example that I had earlier, and I thought I would calculate the kappa for it. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I had a little um, mental lapse here. No, we're now going on to the kappa. We're going to talk about this again later, this diabetes data. This is a case where rater A and Raider B, so two people looked at diagnostic criteria, different uh, values, and determined whether a person had diabetes. And they agreed on 35 of the patients and they disagreed on 40. Checking my time here again. And then they disagreed on uh, 35 of the patients. Now to calculate kappa, you take, this is, looks very much like uh, the chi-square where you have your observed this would be the observed agreement, but it's not the observed number. It's actually the observed agreement or accuracy, which is calculated as um, the number of times they agreed. So the true positives here and the true negatives divided by the total sample size, which is 0.682. Now this kind of terminology, these true positives and true negatives here comes from uh, tables that they're using when you're talking about sensitivity and specificity, for example, the true positive, if you have a test and you know people have disease or not, if your test is positive in people who have disease, so people that fill this category, you know that that's a correct diagnosis. That's a true positive. If you, the test is negative and they don't have disease, that's a true negative. But here's where you have the errors where you say the test is positive, but you actually don't have disease, false positive, and vice versa. You've got the false negatives here. So what you calculate the P value or this percent agreement based on how they agree divided by the total amount. Then we have this PE, which is expected agreement, which is I'll calculate on the next page. So the kappa, you would calculate these values and you plug it into this formula. PE is calculated by looking at the true positives and adding the false negatives and then the false positives multiplying and divided by the total number squared. And you do that both for the true positives and the true negatives. You get this P1 and P2 values. And here this is 35 times 15 times 35 plus 20. So you get a 0.227 value. For the P2, you plug in the values and you get the 0.273 values. You add them, we get a PE value of 0.500. Okay, then you plug them into the formula and you come up with a kappa of 0.364. And here is Cohen's interpretation of what the value is. What he was trying to, to quantify, that is there some value we can give that would let people judge or have some value that they can say this is good or almost perfect agreement between the two reviewers. Our value falls down here in fair agreement. So I would say that's not very good. Um, I don't think that the raters are, they probably need more training, could be a conclusion, or the criteria need to be described a bit better. Um, but I'll tell you though, uh, Cohen was not that enamored of the uh, test statistic that he created because of the fact that um, he felt that this estimate of the PE might be biased. And uh, he didn't think that it was, you know, like a hard and fast rule for that if you had the kappa of 0.65, that you could then compare it like to across all studies. He just felt it, this is an indicator of potentially what would be good or what is better in your study. And he didn't want people to use the hard and fast rules, although people like to do that. They like to get numbers and say, okay, this is great agreement. 
Um, as the example that I'm going to use a study that's published uh, this month out of China, where they were looking at uh, the um, PDL1, which is uh, quite a hot molecule these days, but looking at expression in triple negative breast cancers. And they were wanting to look at the staining in this protocol they had, how well it stained across different tissues from different uh, patients, and also whether it was in like the primary tissue or in the lymph nodes if they had metastases. But I'm going to focus on where they were looking at how pathologists read this and how they were being able to determine or categorize them as being PDL positive or not. And so they had 426 histologically confirmed triple negative breast cancer cases, and 85 of those had lymph node metastases. And so they were looking at the concordance of the reviewers to appropriately diagnose or to determine if you had positive PDL expression or not using the Kappa test and was a test by the Kappa value. Here are their tables for the primary tumor here and for the lymph node mets. And here's pathologist one and pathologist two. And here they have it set up the negative, they 186 people out of the 426, they both categorized as being negative, PDL scoring. This one is 147 were both positive and here they had disagreement. Uh, where pathologist two seemed to be a little bit more on the negative side compared to pathologist one. But their percent agreement was pretty high. It's, it's not perfect, but 78.2 is fairly good agreement. However, with the lymph nodes, agreement was much lower at only 62.4. And I don't know if that had to do with the way the staining was uh, lymph node material might be a little bit more difficult to stain. So again, we go to the quick count site and we do the um, categorical data. So in this time, we're going to look at the kappa. So we go down to the bottom, we're going to quantify our inter-rater agreement. And you can, when this uh, window comes up, you can say how many categories. We're looking at two for a two by two table, but you can look at three for a three by three, et cetera. Uh, but of course, we're just focusing on the fabulous two by two table. So here is the two by two table um, with the, um, from the paper and you plug these in to the form and calculate. And here's what the results you get. It reproduces the table to make sure that it's the way it should be. And here is our kappa of 0.567. And if you look down at the agreement, that is moderate agreement. Okay, so that's not too bad. Uh, let, let's look at the lymph node tissue and see what happens. Um, with lymph node, we have a kappa is calculated only as 2.53, and that's only fair correlation or fair agreement. And so if you look back at the table, we see with the primary tissue, the conclusion of the paper was that the way that this uh, particular scoring system of PDL1 was set up in primary tumor seemed to be pretty good. They felt that there was a fairly good agreement between the pathologists, although there was room for improvement, perhaps uh, continued training. But here they felt that the assay down here with lymph nodes maybe wasn't as good or that the ability of the uh, pathologist to um, really look at and determine uh, staining correctly from the lymph node tissue is not as good. And they suggest that maybe there need to be some improvement in the assay or that there needed to be a better training for the pathologist. And now back to that diabetes uh, one, that here's the uh, kappa we calculated at 0.364. And here is the result from when I entered the data into uh, the PRISM program, and it's 0.364. So, you know, you really don't need computer programs to calculate things. Too. You can do a heck of a lot by hand if you want to. Now, I think I have time to run through quickly a diagnostic test. Unless, are there any questions? I don't see any yet, Kathleen. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. Well, I don't know that's cool. Maybe I've lulled you all to sleep here. Uh, okay, in diagnostic tests, if you have a test, your idea is, your goal is that you want to appropriately diagnose disease. You want to be able to say, okay, you have a positive test, you have disease. You know, it's important to know this because you know you want to be able to get people treatment, appropriate treatment in as early as possible. 
And uh, the two by two test is used, uh, table is used a lot in determining the sensitivity specificity and by extension, the ROC analysis, which will use uh, various levels of sensitivity and specificity in order to help determine the best cutoff. But what you want for a diagnostic test is you want to have a higher proportion of your true positives and true negatives and a lower proportion of your mistakes of your false positive or your false negatives. Now in sensitivity, um, which is one of the factors we use to describe a diagnostic test, is, is the probability of a positive test given a subject is disease positive. And that's written here in probability speak, probability of testing positive given that you're disease positive. And this is a characteristic of a test. What you do is you know, you've set it up where you know who has disease and who doesn't. You run your tests and then you count, you put in here your true positives where the test positive test diagnosed disease appropriately. Your true negatives where your negative test diagnosed the fact you didn't have disease properly and then your error rate. But sensitivity focuses on people who have disease. And what it does is it tests what is the proportion of true positives to all to the false negatives in people who have disease. And of course, you high sensitivity, you would like this value and the better test should have a higher value and a higher sensitivity. As the example, I'm using a, another recent paper that came out where they're comparing the thin prep cytologic test or TCT for diagnosing cervical cancer and they're comparing it with the, an mRNA test for E6 and E7. And they did a group of women where they did both tests and then they look at the test in combination. And they're looking at people who had cervical abnormalities. So they're already a little bit higher risk for uh, perhaps having this, the HCL, the high-grade squamous interepithelial lesion. So I'm gonna focus here on the TCT first. Sensitivity calculation for the TCT to diagnose HCL is, remember the probability of testing positive given you have disease. Sensitivity is the true positive. So that's 71 divided by 71 plus the false negatives, 19. So we have a value of 0.789 or 78.9%. That's a good, pretty good sensitivity. I think you want a sensitivity in a test to be above 70. Of course, you can have sensitivities that are higher than that, but you don't want something that would be really for a decent test to be much lower than 70. And if you have to, a test to be 100% sensitive, have the sensitivity to be 100, you have zero false negatives, it would be a case like here where this group is a distribution of people who are not diabetic. This is the distribution of test scores of people who are diabetic. If you set the cutoff here of being uh, determining if you are normal or diabetic, so this is your the range. So if you have a blood glu glucose above this, you would be so you'd be told you were uh, diabetic. Now this, with the 100% sensitive test, you're catching everybody who has a diabetic distribution of the test. So you're not gonna miss anybody. And that's important to do if you have a disease perhaps that is very uh, severe and life-threatening and you wanna make sure that you diagnose everybody that you can. But that's at the cost here of these people here who don't have diabetes, but their blood glucose levels are in this range above the cutoff, you said. So you're going to have a whole bunch of false positives here, where people, you're going to tell people who don't have diabetes that they do. And uh, that can have its own consequences uh, to people. Now, to run to determine the sensitivity and specificity for your data, you would do a Fisher's, I'm um, sorry, you, this, it does a Fisher's exact test that's kind of chosen, but you would click this box here and that previous table that I had here, you just enter the data that way into the prism and it calculates, it gives you the Fisher's exact. And then here I, the sensitivity actually gives all four of the variables. I just cut it off for sensitivity and that's 0.789 if you were to round it up to three, which is what we found by our own calculations. Again, proving you don't need computer programs all the time to do things, you can do it yourself. Specificity is, I'm still checking the time, uh, the probability of a negative test given the subject is disease negative. So again, written here, probability of testing negative given that you don't have disease. And that's the number of true negatives 
divided by the number of true negatives plus the false positives. In this case, you have a specificity of 66, which isn't bad either. Um, you do want, you like to see above, you know, 0.7 or 70% for a better test, but this isn't really that bad. And here's the specificity uh, determined by <coughs> PRISM. And again, here you have, if this is where you would have 100% specificity, where you set your cutoff value for your test is determining if you're diabetic or normal. Here you're, you're correctly diagnosing all people who are non-diabetic, but then at the same time, you're telling this large proportion of people who are actually diabetic that they don't have disease. And that's probably more heinous than diagnosing too many people as having diabetes, but letting this group of people believe that they have normal blood sugar and uh, not treat it um, and take care of that could be have bad consequences down the line. Positive predictive values are the kind of value that as a patient, I want to know. What a positive predictive value says that it's the probability of having disease given that I test positive. And it's, you can see it's slightly different with sensitivity, but this is a case where the doctor hands you, tells you you've got a positive test. And the question is, do I really have disease? And that, that's important for the patient to know because, you know, as we know, positive tests don't always mean you have disease and negative tests don't always mean you don't. But you calculate the uh, positive predictive value here as the true positives divided by the true positive as the false positives. And here you have a value then of 39.9%, which is pretty low because it's saying if a woman has a positive TCT test, there's a 39.9% chance she actually has HCIL. So there's a larger percent prob probability that she doesn't. So the TCT test is not very good at telling you if you have disease or not. The negative predictive value is again saying that it's the probability of being disease negative given that you have a negative test. And the same thing as a patient, you wanna know, am I negative? You know, I've got a negative test. Do I really not have disease? In this case, it's the number of true negatives you calculate divided by the number of true negatives by the number of false negatives. So that's a 208 divided by 208 plus 19, and you get 91.6%. And that's pretty good. So that's saying that if you get a negative test, you have a very high chance you truly don't have HCIL. Here's the table from the paper that gives you their some of the TCT tests alone and the mRNA test and plus the combination. Uh, set the values are not that different from each other in some of the values. In fact, sensitivity is a little bit low in the, con in the um, combo. Specificity is higher. The positive predictive value is higher here than it is with either test alone, meaning that it's going to be able to tell you that you have a little bit more certainty if you get a positive combination test that you actually have the HCIL. And the negative predictive values actually are, are good across the board. They really don't improve it much. But their conclusion is that they feel that, that relative diagnostic value may be further improved by the combination detection of TCT and the mRNA test. OK, so that is actually the end of my talk. Um, a few takeaway is you can certainly do a variety of categorical data analyses using that lovely two by two table. And I didn't present here all the ones that you could do. That may be a lecture further down the line. Uh, for two independent groups of categorical data, use the Fisher's exact test. Uh, when you do your data analysis plan, say that you will do the Fisher's exact test unless your program says, no, your sample size is too large, I'm going to default to the chi-square, which with large sample size, it's going to come, you know, be very close to what the exact test would tell you. Use a paired analysis for your data that are correlated or paired. Uh, don't treat them as independent. Um, and then when setting up your two by two table, as I said before, it's often best to put your outcome in the columns and your exposure, your test and such in the rows, because that just gives a when you go down the line and want to look at other analyses using a two by two table, setting it up that way is going to set you up to do correct interpretations of the data. Are there any questions?
Okay. Thank you for listening. And I, I did go rather fast, didn't I? Yeah. Looks like you covered everything thoroughly as usual, <laughs> uh, Kathleen. Uh, um, but yeah, thank you for the informative presentation. And um, to everybody who joined, thank you for uh, being here. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all next month. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, uh, to answer one of those questions, um, the talk will be recorded and put on the Cancer Center's YouTube channel. So the video will be available there. Okay. Thanks, Kathleen. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Take care. <laughs>